In this video, we will be solving basic differential equations. A differential equation is just an equation that has a derivative in it. So in this one, we see the g prime. That's what makes this a differential equation. Solving this means getting rid of that prime, getting it turned back into regular function g of x. So of course, we will use the integral to sort of undo the derivative. So in other words, if we take the integral of g prime that's going to turn this back into function g um, so we're taking the integral of both sides of the equation so we also have the integral of 4 squared dx so on the left side we now just have plain old function g which is what we wanted on the right hand side we can use the power rule of integration so we will add 1 to this exponent which gives us x to the third power and then we have to divide by that new exponent so that's why we're going to have 4 over 3 and then don't forget to include your constant of integration c we can use this initial condition to figure out uh, what the constant of integration actually is. So g at negative 1 is 3. So that means um, that 4 over 3 times negative 1 to the third power plus c must equal 3. So we can easily solve this for c. Uh, negative 1 to the third power is still going to be negative 1. So uh, we will end up with negative 4 thirds plus c is equal to 3. So now if I add 4 thirds to both sides, I get c is equal to 3 plus 4 over 3. But of course we need like denominators here. So I'm going to multiply by 3 over 3. So at this point, I'm really looking at 9 over 3. So 9 over 3 plus 4 over 3, that's going to be 13 over 3. So I can substitute that back in, and that will give me the final answer. So g of x will equal 4 over 3 x to the third power plus 13 over 3. So we solved the differential equation. Let's do it again. So if we want to solve this differential equation, again, we're going to integrate both sides. So I, I don't think I'm even going to show the integral on the left hand side. I'm just going to go ahead and bloop, turn this into a regular f of s. But um, I integrated the left hand side. And then I will go ahead and show that I'm integrating the right-hand side. 12s cubed ds. So how do we do this? We're going to use the power rule of integration. So I'm going to increase this exponent by 1. So that's going to give me s squared. And then I must divide by that new power. But 10 divided by 2 is and then I'm going to do something similar right here. I'm going to increase this power by 1, so this will give me s to the fourth power, and then I'm going to divide by that new power. 12 divided by 4 is 3. And then on the end, I'm going to put my constant of integration c. But then off to the side, I'm going to use this fact called an initial condition. Uh, to figure out what the value of c actually is. So since f at 3 is 2, um, that means that 5 times 3 squared minus 3 times 3 to the 4th power um, plus c is equal to 2. So obviously I'm just substituting 3 in for all of these s's and I'm setting that equal to 2. So let's see, um, 3 squared is 9, so uh, and, this, and then 5 times 9 
is 45. And then um, 3 to the 4th power is 81. I don't actually remember what 3 times 81 is off the top of my head. So I'm going to get back to you on that one. All right, so yeah. Right, so um, 3 times 81 was 243. And then 45 minus 243 is negative 198. And now we're going to add that to both sides. So we end up with C is equal to 200. Now substituting that back in, we get the final answer. So F of S is equal to 5S squared minus 3s to the fourth power plus 200. This is the solution to the differential equation. Ooh, this one has a second derivative in it, so we're going to have to integrate twice. Integrating both sides of the equation, all right, so we have the, uh, the integral of f double prime of x on the left hand side and then on the right hand side we have the integral of x squared dx. So uh, the integral of f double prime gives you f prime. Um, and now on the right hand side um, we will use the power rule for integration. Increasing the exponent by 1 gives us x to the third power then we have to divide by that new power. So that's why I'm going to put a 1 third in the front. And then we will put plus C for the constant of integration. So let's go ahead and use this initial condition to figure out what C is right here. So F prime at 0 is 8. So that means that um, 1 third times 0 to the third power plus c is equal to 8. Um, well, this whole term is just 0, so I just have c is equal to 8. Substituting that back in, we have f prime at x is equal to 1 third x to the third power plus 8. We have to keep going until we get all the way down to f of x. So uh, we're going to integrate again. So if I integrate um, the left hand side of the equation, I have this. Now I integrate the right hand side of the equation as well. x to the third power plus 8 and then my dx. Uh, the integral of f prime will just be regular f, which is what we wanted. Here we will integrate term by term. So um, the power rule of integration, we will increase this exponent by 1. So we will have x to the fourth power. Now we must divide by that new power. So I'm going to end up with 1 twelfth. So just to be super clear, uh, I'm dividing one-third by four. But if I divide a fraction by four, I can really just put four in the denominator. And that's where the 12 is coming from. Anyway, moving on to the eight. Uh, if I integrate a constant, it's just going to become blessed with an extra variable. So the integral of eight is going to be eight x. And then we go ahead and add our constant of integration up. Oh, well, we are we already used the letter C, so we are supposed to use a different letter because these are two different constants. So instead of the usual C, I'm going to go ahead and put D this time. They gave us another initial condition that we can use to find D. F at zero is equal to four. Let's go ahead and use that now. So that means that um, 1 12th times 0 to the 4th power plus 8 times 0 plus D is equal to 4. 
Well, both of these uh, first two terms are just zero, so that's just going to give us d equals 4. And you substitute that back in, and that will be our final answer. So f of x is equal to 1 12th x to the 4th power plus 8x plus 4. This is the solution to the differential equation. Problem number 63 relies on the relationship between position, velocity, and acceleration. So let's do a brief little side lesson here. So here's my position function, velocity function, and acceleration function. They are related by differentiation and integration. If I take the derivative, then I'm moving in this direction. So the derivative of position is velocity. The derivative of velocity gives me acceleration. If I do integration, we are going to move in the opposite direction. So if I integrate an acceleration function, I'm going to get a velocity function. If I integrate a velocity function, it's going to become a position function. Um, if for this particular problem, they're talking about a particle that's moving along the x-axis. So for my position function, you're going to see me use x at t because that will be the uh, position on the x-axis at time t. So a particle moves along the x-axis at a velocity of v at t equals 1 over the square root of t for times greater than 0. At time t equals 1, its position is x equals 4. Find the acceleration and position functions for the particle. So the bottom line is we are given a velocity function and then we are being asked to find an acceleration function and a position function. So we have to start with velocity because that's what we are given. So v of t is equal to 1 over, well it says the square root of t, but first of all you know that's the same thing as t to the 1 half power. But then once you have that in your head, if I want to sort of uh, bring this out of the denominator, you're going to easily understand that this is t to the negative one-half power. So we have the velocity function. Um, if I want to get from velocity to acceleration, I need to take the derivative. So that's what I'm going to do kind of off to the side in this direction. So um, uh, the derivative of velocity is going to give me my acceleration function. So let's go ahead and take the derivative. We can simply do the power rule where uh, we take this negative one half and, and put it in the front. And then we uh, subtract one from this exponent. So we're going to end up with negative three over two. So this is the acceleration function right here. Now we need to find the position function. Well, now we are going in the opposite direction. We're sort of going backwards. If I want to go from velocity to position, I need to integrate. So I'm going to go ahead and integrate both sides of the equation. So um, x at t is going to equal the integral of t to the negative one-half power dx, well, dt. So um, x at t is going to equal power rule of integration. So we're going, going to add 1 to this exponent. So that's going to make this into a positive one-half power. So we have t to the positive one-half power. But then we must divide by that new exponent. 
dividing by one half is the same as multiplying by two. And then don't forget your constant of integration. So time t equals one. So that means we're gonna substitute one in for the time. And we have uh, two times one to the one half power plus c. And at time t equals one, the position is four. So all of this is gonna to equal to four. Well, one to the one half power is still one. Two times one is two. So this is really just two plus c is equal to four. And then subtracting two from both sides gives us c is equal to two. Substituting that back in, we will have our position function. So x at t is equal to 2 times t to the 1 half power plus 2. And if you wanted to, you could write x at t is equal to 2 times the square root of t plus 2. So that is your position function. So we were asked to find the acceleration function, which is here in purple, and the position function is here in blue. A particle initially at rest moves along the x-axis such that its acceleration at time t greater than zero is given by a at t equals cosine t. At the time t equals zero, its position is x equals three. So for part A of this problem, we need to find the velocity and position functions of the particle. So basically, we are given an acceleration function. So that's where we will start. But then we need to find the velocity and position functions. Let me add one other thing in here right now. They sort of snuck it in um, a very sneaky initial condition. They said um, the particle is initially at rest. So initially means that uh, the time is at t equals zero. At rest means that the velocity is zero. So this is an indirect way of saying um, the velocity at zero is equal to zero. So that's just another initial condition that you need to be aware of. So they gave us the acceleration function. So let's start by just writing that down. So the acceleration at t is equal to cosine t. Remember the relationship between position, velocity, and acceleration. If I take the derivative, that will move me in this direction. Um, if I take the derivative of a position function, I get velocity. The derivative of a velocity function gives me acceleration. Uh, but in this case, we're given acceleration. So if I want to get from acceleration to velocity, I'm going to have to integrate. And then once I get that velocity function, if I want a position function, I will again have to integrate. So let's go ahead and integrate both sides of this equation. The integral of an acceleration function is going to give us velocity. So now we've got velocity on the left-hand side. Um, but what's the integral of cosine t? Well, ask yourself, the derivative of what will give us cosine? The derivative of sine is cosine. So the integral is sine t. And then we add c for the constant of integration. Let's see if we can use an initial condition to figure out exactly what c is. What do they say? OK. Oh, well, we have that sort of um, stealthy initial condition right here. The velocity at time 0 is equal to 0. So if I substitute zero in for t. So the velocity at time zero would be the sine of zero plus c. 
and we're told that that is going to equal zero. Well, what is the sign of zero? Uh, the sine of zero, remember, um, zero is right here on the unit circle. Sine is the y value. So um, the sine of zero is actually zero. So that means um, that this is zero plus c, which means that c is actually equal to zero. So uh, basically, I can just rewrite this as uh, the velocity at t is equal to the sine of of t without the c. So now we need to go ahead and find the position function. Um, we found one of the things we were looking for. We found the velocity function. So let's sort of start over and turn this into a position function. Remember if we integrate velocity we get position. So we need to integrate both sides of the equation. So we will do the integral of velocity and we have to take the integral of the other side of the equation as well. The integral of velocity will give us position. Um, now, what is the integral of sine? Ask yourself, the derivative of what will give us sine? Well, the derivative of cosine is negative sine. That's close. So that means the derivative of negative cosine will give us positive sine. So that's the integral. And uh, we have to go ahead and add our constant of integration. We've already used the letter C, so um, let's use the letter D this time. Let's look back and see if there's an initial condition that will help us find D. So we see right here at time t equals 0, the position is 3. So let's substitute those values into our function. Okay, so the position at time t equals 0 will be given by uh, negative cosine 0. And we're told that uh, this is, well, negative cosine 0 plus d. And that should equal 3. So what is the cosine of zero? So remember, cosine is the x value on the unit circle. So um, here's zero right here. The cosine is going to be one because it's over here to the right. So the cosine of zero is one. Um, with this negative sign in front, that means we have negative one. So we have negative one plus d is equal to three. Adding 1 to both sides, we see that d is equal to 4. And substituting that back in, we will have our position function. So p at t is equal to negative cosine t plus 4. All right, so we found a velocity function here in red, position function here in blue. Those were the two things we were asked to find. So finally, um, there's a part B, which should be pretty quick. Find the values of T for which the particle is at rest. When they say that the particle is at rest, indirectly they're saying that the velocity is equal to zero. So we need to find the values of t for which the velocity is equal to zero. So let's scroll back up and remember what our velocity function is. Velocity is equal to sine t in this case. So let's write that down. So velocity at t is equal to sine t. But we want to know for what values of t will the velocity equal zero? So where will sine t equal zero? So we're solving this uh, simple trig equation. Uh, be careful about one thing. You guys are very used to solving on the interval between zero and two pi. So usually we only look at one turn around the unit circle. 
but they did not give us any such limitation. So uh, in some way we need to express the infinitely many solutions to this little equation. But for starters, where is the sine of t equal to zero? Remember that sine is the y value on the unit circle. So the y values will be zero here and here. In other words, at zero itself and then also at pi. But again, that's just one spin around the unit circle. So let's start with the first solution, which is zero. So we can just go ahead and say that t equals zero is one solution. But look, if I added pi, that will take me from here to here. So by adding pi, I'm getting yet another solution. But what if I added pi again? All right, that would take me back to another solution. So now I've just added two pi. So you can see I can just do that over and over again. Every time I add pi, I'm gonna end up at another solution. So that's gonna be two pi, three pi, four pi, so really, um, you see that any multiple of pi is going to be a solution. So we can say 0 plus n pi. We're using n to capture all of the infinitely many multiples of pi. Um, so for the sake of the college board who's grading your AP exam, you should say what n represents. So often this is an integer, but we have to be a little bit careful because um, they told us that we're only dealing with times that are greater than zero. Integers can be negative. So we could say something like um, n is a positive integer. So this would be the answer. Um, but do we really need the zero? So a simpler way of writing our set of solutions would be t is equal to n pi. So that's pretty elegant. 